This is really a continuation of the discussion that we've been having on building uh, an ecosystem for ocean uh, data sharing. And uh, indeed, uh, it's one of the tasks that we're trying to understand ourselves, in fact, in this uh, question of marine pollution in the ocean, particularly marine chemical pollution. Uh, as I said, we released a report last year uh, on marine chemical pollution, and there was a, certainly a, a dark of data. It was very, very difficult to understand and find where that data was. And now, trying to ask the question, what is it that we need to do to put together the, uh, okay. the collaborations, the partnerships, the data sharing that will, in fact, allow us to see, uh, give us a better picture of that ocean, uh, marine ocean pollution, marine pollution, rather, uh, is truly a, a complicated and difficult challenge. Um, and I'm hoping, in part, we can unpack that in, in this session. So let me introduce uh, our panelists. Uh, right next to me, Oliver Steeds, uh, Chief Executive of Necton Foundation. Uh, Kimberly Matheson, um, who's the Chief Executive of Hub Ocean, which is uh, sponsoring uh, the summit. Thank you very much. Uh, Jamie uh, McMichael Phillips, uh, right at the end, I do apologize, um, uh, Director of Seabed 2030, which is uh, a major program looking at uh, mapping the seabed and Andre Beira uh, in just before the end, uh, head of the Brazilian Observatory of Maritime Policies. Welcome uh, to all of you. Um, I mean, I just wanted to follow up on that discussion. I mean, some are saying that we are going to be overwhelmed with data, and others are saying that actually the data just simply isn't available around certain specific questions and issues. I just want to get your sense of where you sit on that, that conundrum that we face in the ocean. Oliver. Ooh, thank you. That's a big one to start things off. Um, I think both are true. It depends on who you ask. Um, and we work with ocean nations, and what we see is that there is a great bias in, in data, depending on who you ask. Um, if we look at the deep sea, for example, you know, there are a small number of, uh, of, of nations uh, and institutes that have the technology to be able to explore the deep sea um, and to gather that kind of data. But then if you look at the front lines of, of the climate crisis um, and the biodiversity crisis, um, the people who have done the least um, are, are often on the front lines of that, and they do not have the technology that they need to be able to gather that data. So there is a dearth of, you know, there's a big gap of data where it's fundamentally needed as well. So it depends which yeah, way you go with that. I sort of feel similarly. I, I think there is, there is data, but there isn't the right data. Um, but Kimberly, do you, do you see that? Well, I, I can only agree. And, and maybe out of all of the work that Hub Ocean does, we're working with data from science, data from governments, and then data from industry. So if I had to highlight maybe one of those three as particularly challenging, I would have to say that industry um, has so much to offer mm. relative to sort of where the needle has been set so far. I have 25 years in industry myself. Today, I'm the head of Hub Ocean, which is a foundation, nonprofit that works across all of these sectors. We'll only be successful if we unite all of that together. But unlocking industry data might be the one that's come the least far and potentially is the one that still has massive amounts of value to get unlocked. So, I mean, the question of trying to create a meta-database for the ocean, in a way, which is something that's sort of been talked about over the last couple of sessions, how, how important is it for that to happen? Mm -hmm. And, you know, is that going to resolve our problem around how we understand and have evidence for the ocean? Or yeah. So I, I think that um, this is not the newest idea on the planet, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. the, the data that we have, thankfully, so far has been built on centuries of data repositories, right, that are aggregated up and that we're all trying to dance on and do our best work on. Yeah. What we're trying to do is use the best of technologies. I spent the last better part of a decade with Microsoft, right? So think a decade ago when we put all of these efforts together. We didn't have as much low-cost technology. We didn't have as much low-cost sensoring, right, or cloud-based compute at the low cost we have it today to be able to stitch and tie this together. That's one aspect. Together with low-hanging satellite data, which is enormously useful, right? There are many things from a technology perspective that push us forward to the art of the possible mm -hmm. that we can look at again. I focus on at Hub Ocean when we think about what would be a useful frame to try to bring a very agile cloud-based asset technology to? The first place you go is 
to try to unite a world around these open APIs. Data sync APIs, if you're in the Iliad language, a big project in Europe, but APIs that unite us all and bring us together. And I think we need lenses, which the last panel talked about as well, Anya raised it. A lens that we could talk to each other through could be to take great work that's done already, and if I would call out three parts of a triangle that we could see a massive data connectivity exercise through, it might be, think about human assets on the top, right? Where are all of the human assets of the world? Windmills, um, ships going around the world, everything that dances in or around or impacts the ocean from a human asset perspective, coupled with the essential ocean variables, the 31, which you double click on and there's 150 or so, coupled with the essential biodiversity variables. Imagine if we brought ourselves together with open APIs on an agile cloud-based platform through the lens of those three very big axes that we would want to connect together and understand correlations through. At least that starts to perform for us maybe a, a more goal-oriented exercise and maybe a uniting front that all of these good efforts we heard on must continue. But we're after a way of sort of uniting them and aggregating them, and then perhaps the industry angle would be maybe our special task within this realm to work on from an unlocking perspective. I want to come back, I think, to the question of you know, there are not just one, but several of these kind of initiatives that are out there and, um, you know, all slightly different and all trying at the yep. end of the day to create some sort of uh, clear vision of what the ocean is. Um, and in your case, I believe uh, a, digital, a digital ocean map uh, in a way. Uh, if I can come back to that in a second and come to you, Jamie, and just sort of go down one step and just ask... I mean, you're trying to do that for the ocean floor, effectively, aren't you? You're trying to draw together all of the, the mapping, create, mapping data that's out there to be able to do that. Yes, and I think going back to the earlier question, is, is there enough or too much data? From my perspective, there is absolutely not enough data. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or, or from two perspectives. Firstly, there's data that exists that is not made available, and there is also data that simply doesn't exist, and we've got to go out and collect that. Yeah. And, and actually, I think going back to what one of the other speakers, Anya, I think it was, was, was talking about rather than data sets, data flows. And, and from my perspective, as a, somebody who's interested in delivering the world ocean map by the year 2030, we need that data to be flowing. Yeah. And you know, why do we need it? Well, we're, we're operating in our oceans on a daily basis, it is, you know, the ocean interacts with our everyday lives, be that climate, climate change, be it safety, navigation, you name it. But we've only mapped 25% of it so far. 140 million kilometers away, Mars, and we've managed to map over 90% of the surface of Mars. But back home, we've got that critical knowledge gap. No. So we need to accelerate our activities, we need to collaborate. And that's, that's absolutely... There's data that we know, there's data that we don't know, there's data that's buried in lots of different places that could easily be, re be surfaced, I guess. I, I would say yeah. that, uh, conservatively, there's about 20% more of our ocean mapped, but that data exists in long-forgotten archives or it's restricted for, for many reasons. Uh, but, my, but at the end of the day, you know, we are not looking as, as ocean mappers within Seabed 2030, we're not looking at high-res ocean maps, we're looking at a fairly low-resolution map. So a lot of that data, with a bit of effort, could be released. But it's the effort that needs to be put in. There's time, there's resource, there's money. And also, changing that mindset of, of making data freely available, gather once used many times, rather than something you protect because uh, it's embargoed because you have to write an academic paper, or it's embargoed because it's, it's close inshore within your EEZ, and therefore there's potentially, from one perspective, a national security aspect, or it's got commercial value, and, and people don't want to let others realize that commercial value. Andre, I wonder if you could reflect on this broad question, but with the context of Brazil, because I know you've had lots of challenges drawing together and sharing data within Brazil. Yes. 
How do you look at this? Well, I, I think the main problem we have in Brazil, because um, the most part of the data is collected by um, official improvement, official projects, not by industry, not by um, just a little about academic or uh, NGOs. And we have two different problems. The first one is the vertical problem. Each one collects each data they want. And an horizontal problem. We have to know all the problems at the same time, because the sea is a complex system. So how to build uh, a policy framework of mutual trust from the triple alexes, the academia, the in industry, and the government. So we started two years ago to rebuild a new uh, national maritime policy in the government, um, anchored by the academic perspective, and after that, after one year discussing a new kind of uh, sharing data, uh, they decided to create uh, a, a coordination structure um, focused on in a governmental main body because they don't have uh, uh, interest in money. They have to think in the the better from the country for the country. Mm -hmm. So they will share all the data at this new um, structure of coordination and it will be uh, available for everybody. And does that in data does that data include sort of the industry data and other data that uh, yes. it does yes, it, it includes, includes sort of it is in fact a, all a of them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I guess that, that sort of also raises this question of you know, the fair and equitable sharing of data. And Oliver, I know that, you know, one of the things that Necton is trying to do is to make sure that, you know, there is, you're working with governments and you're absolutely clear that those governments need to have that data themselves as well. How important is, is that? Because, I mean, and it's a question I also want to ask um, you as well, Kimberly, because it, you're on a separate Microsoft platform. How accessible is that? But what is the importance of sharing and having equitable access to the data? I mean, I think equity and equitable access to data is fundamental to the future of the ocean, which we all want. Yeah. Um, and yeah. without that, um, well, we are where we are now. Um, yes, things are getting better, but you know, I think it's critical to understand what the needs of the data is. Yeah. And the priorities for that for different countries is, is, different to, um, is different from one country to another. So we think it's important to start by asking that simple question if you're going to work in a country. Um, what do you want? What do you need? What are the priorities for you here for your, for your policies? And, and how can we help to achieve those outcomes? And then what is the plan with that data? How will that data then be made accessible to others? Um, how will it be stored? How will it be utilized? Um, and how can it be um, made available, um, open access, um, where, wherever possible? Because recognizing there are some commercial sensitivities around it, but by and large, we're seeing that uh, the countries where we've worked, that all that data, the vast majority of that data becomes open access because it starts from a basis of the national priority first. Yeah. That's interesting because I think a lot of science goes to countries and gets the data, takes it away and you know, uses it in, in other contexts, but not mm -hmm. really in the context of the development of a country or indeed the, the further knowledge for that country. I, mm. I guess that's probably parachute science, uh, science I think it's called. But, uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And there's yeah, still a lot of that that's going on. And that comes down to the biases that we see in data acquisition and data utilization as well. Depends who you ask the question to, what data you need and why you need it. We also know that you know, we have a short window where we have to gather and, and utilize the data as quickly as we can. So how do we speed it up? How do we scale the, uh, the opportunities, the utilization of it? Um, and ensure that it, is being ex that it is accessible for the people that really need it. I'm hearing more and more from policymakers, look, we don't need more data. We've known our direction of travel for the last decade or so when it comes yeah. to the environment, when it comes to the ocean. Why do we need more? Um, that's not the problem. The problem isn't data, it's how we utilize, how we access that data, and how 
Um, of course, you know, I take an opposite view to that, yeah. Um, yeah. that we, we do need more data, but we've got to combat that as well. So what, um, you went to the Maldives recently, and what, so how do you see that data that you've acquired there being translated into what the government needs? So the government needs in the Maldives very, in, in, uh, very specifically was to um, have a survey done from the surface down to a thousand meters to try and understand yes. kind of what, what's in the water so that those yeah. that data can then inform their marine spatial plan um, and essentially and then setting up their marine protected areas. So it was um, yeah, we co-designed it, co-produced it, but from that basis with the government of defining and co-defining what their priorities of it were. And then we build a science plan around it. Kimberly, I, I, the same question, really. I think it's a really important question. I mean, you're creating this database. It's out of a private um, set of softwares and frameworks that, mm. are, that are out there. What, to what extent, I know you say it's open access, but to what extent is it genuinely going to be that? And what do you... Mm sort of appreciate by that idea of open access and ultimately what people will be able to use it. Yeah, if, if the world is, you know, full of categories about what our, our organization is, I find, a hard, I find it very hard to place us in one category, which maybe is an indication of something I'm hopeful about, that we maybe need some out-of-the-box thinking where we aren't painting ourselves into just the actors in the spaces that we've known them already. Mm. So you... Habotion is an independent, not-for-profit foundation. So as we approach our work, we're funded for the long term to aggregate data and return it to the common good. And we're funded by industry philanthropy with a long perspective to create this, this thing for the world, but with an ambition also as a secondary agenda to when industry would like to share their data only on the conditions that they're enriched by the data as well, and then they'd like to be able to take the data for their for-profit scenarios. If it's appropriate for us to put a price tag on those assets and fund some of the infrastructure of how we work, then we would see that as maybe not only good, but ultimately to have a sustainability to our own structure if in 10 years we should run out of philanthropic funding, seems very smart and necessary as mm -hmm. well. But with respect to our model, we don't anticipate putting price tags, for example, on the vast majority of what we do. We would never take an open data set and put it behind a paywall, mm -hmm. right? We're focused on work that is done for countries, just like the type you mentioned in my very first data question is, and so the Maldives, how will they carry on with the data apparatus that you put in place. Because for example, the work we've started with the Norwegian government, with the Netherlands, with Canada, right? When we unlock industrial data, just as a very concrete example, the wonderful authorita authoritative data that Norway, for example, has collected, the partnership we have in dialogue is not at all about being competitive or taking data that will then be locked away so that it can't be accessed, but it's about taking the opportunity for that authoritative data to also mingle with industry data, because otherwise, what do you do with it? Where do you put it? And then if you've got wonderful data sets from science that you've unlocked, but they don't necessarily have a home, or they've been parked in a data set, a data base, which is infinitely unusable for the vast majority of people that would love to use it, it's about connecting those things together in a place where if we didn't exist, it's actually a bit hard to imagine then how does a sustainable, enduring platform that can move at speed, utilizing the agility of the new technologies, actually empower us to go faster? And we must go faster. We cannot live in the existing models. And that's part of our, our ethos is and our, and our recognition that it isn't that we're making up a need or locking things away from people. It's just to create new spaces, yeah. data spaces, pre-competitive spaces, arenas where this data can mix and mingle and stack in the least frictional you know, ways possible, it's ultimately very, very necessary for progress at speed and I mean, scale. It's part of the attractiveness, in a way, of an initiative like this. But it also does raise that question, you know, whose data is it? And shouldn't ocean data be public data? Mm -hmm. And don't public institutions, like the United Nations, for example, yeah. um, uh, have a real role in collecting and being able to deliver and being able to own that data. Absolutely. And ownership is one thing. Sharing data 
doesn't mean that you don't own it anymore, yeah. right? Yeah. And sharing data with the stipulation that it's available for the public good is also vital, important, and, and very worthy to put that data out, right? Yeah. Yeah. We anticipate perhaps the actors which are going to present us with many more challenges and layers about data sharing is, again, industry. And that's, in some sense, very fair. For industry, data sharing is never going to be all or nothing. When you meet industry, you have to be focused on very, very specific, detailed exercises of mapping against risks, competitive risks, legal risks that they have and they anticipate contractual uh, limitations. You have to be willing to go into dialogue and get very detailed about temperature, salinity, subsea currents in the water column data, water column from seismic, etc. pulling it out, finding the spaces where they can get comfortable to share data, which, as one of the speakers before said, they've collected and protected for 50 years, and they actually never needed to do that. So it's very important. And in fact, we're chipping into those places. And you know, I'm optimistic. I have no illusions that this is a short-term cause we're working on. But I think we're going to need several levels and steps for industry to be able to see themselves comfortable in moving into this. Some of those will involve immediate incentives back to them, so we have to work on those value creation propositions for industry all the way. But some of them are just a recognition. Regulation pushes them there. The common good agenda pushes them there. No longer do we accept that companies operate taking oil and gas or anything else out of our oceans without steering mechanisms that we, the public, and our common ocean can observe and understand the whole picture of how they're impacting us. Jamie, I wonder if you'd tackle that same question, because quite a lot of your data is, is shared data. Well, th yes, uh, the, the majority of... So Seabed 2030 is an accelerator to a long-term program called GEBCO, the General Bathymetric Chart of the Ocean. So that was established way back in 1901 by Prince Albert of Monaco. Um, 1903, sorry, and the, the, the composite data was, was driven by a mass of volunteers, so we're, we're there to accelerate, but one of the things that we promote, and, and it's been long since established, is delivery of that data to an archive that is administered on behalf of the International Hydrographic Organization by NOAA, it sits in Boulder, Colorado, and that is a publicly accessible archive, so the data is publicly available. And we then make a product out of it, the Jebco map, which is free to use, free to download. So no restrictions on its use. It's a public service, essentially. Now, there are, you know, going back to the, you know, we protected this data for 50 years. We, we're not going to release it. There's a lot of discussions that are ongoing, have been, have been had, are, are still to be had to try and encourage data owners to release their data for use in an ideal world, to sit it in the data archive in Boulder, Colorado, so it's free, freely available for anybody to use, or to try and decimate the data to a resolution that the data owner is comfortable for which it can be released. Now, that doesn't always happen. Sometimes we're told we can use it for our purposes, but it's to go no further. But in an ideal world, it should be publicly available because, again, I think I take taking the point that, that Kimberly said that you know, data in our ocean shouldn't necessarily be owned by one organisation, one data owner. It should be made available for everybody because it is one ocean. You know, we're, we're talking about our ocean, one ocean. Andre, May I yes, I want you yes. to actually talk about that because I, think, I know. I think he uh, at the end of. Uh, is uh, talking is very important. We have just one war ocean. And industry has a nationality. Uh, one, two, a lot of them, but has countries and sovereignty interests behind them. Uh, even NGOs are um, places where they live but at the ocean, nobody lives. And there is nobody to take care of this no sovereignty place. Uh, I think we have lost a, a big opportunity uh, at the discussions of BBNJ convention, almost at the end, um, to create a, a special organization 
to collect all this data uh, anchored in United Nations uh, to have a, a, a bigger um, accomplishment of all countries, all the industries, because it will be uh, just in one point. And nowadays, what I see is each country, each um, hub uh, has this specific interests, and I think it's a, a wrong way of thinking to think industry, they don't want to share their data. I agree with Kimberly. Yes, they want it. But not every data, not the, the main body of their profits and interests. So if we have uh, a special international organization uh, collecting all of them, it will be useful for everybody. So. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? Because we keep coming back to this idea that yes. there needs to be some sort of supranational organization yes. that brings all of our data together. And I know, Kimberly, you, you, know, <laughs> you obviously are in a way doing that. Um, uh, but uh, I just, just reflect on that, will you? Because you know, it brings up all the questions that we've just raised, the question of ownership, the question of public data, the question of uh, cleaning the data from companies that has already come in without recognizing their special interests, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. What, you know, what is your response to that? Well, every to that? time someone says, you know, we need this, this international borderless thing to collect the yes. data, I want to hop up and down and say, we, we're trying to build that for the world. But many others are trying to build that for the world yeah. too. And, and the most important thing is that, you know, I think the call for all of us is to just desperately try to get rid of the loss of data, the redundancy of these exercises, all of the incredible inefficiency that exists in all of these efforts right now, and put together places of gravity. Data has gravity, right? We heard before about the sophisticated analytical models, call them climate models, call them the next generation of AI, you know, fluid climate models, right? All of this is so hungry for so much more data than we're able to provide it. So the call for aggregating data, it's profoundly important from so many perspectives for us. I have no illusion that somehow the world in five or 10 years is going to decide on one in one data apparatus, right? I would love to claim that I, you know, would love to put our hand up and say, oh my God, could we even take an inch of that incredible what a responsibility that would be for the world. I don't think it gets there like that. So our, our dream and our endeavor is to create an interconnected space where there's probably a lot of nodes with gravity and you can choose your node and connecting your data to it would be incredibly easy, no matter what data scientist capability you have or you don't have. Wouldn't that be an incredible world mm. that all of us could self-service all of the micro data sets and all of the massive data sets of countries and the World Ocean Database data sets and put them all together in a way that truly was fluid. That's where we want to go in order to land them in powerful scenarios, whether it's science models, the policies of nations, right? Industrial rewiring, which has to happen in a profound way over the next decade. That must be the dream. If we can deliver part of that with gravity as one node with gravity, I think that would be spectacular. There will be many nodes and many, many of us that have to contribute to this. Oliver, I mean, you're nodding, so I mean, would you like to just sort of... I agree. Yeah. I mean, I think yeah. we probably all agree. Does anyone disagree in the room? I yeah, think we all probably anybody? agree. <laughs> yeah. um, Jamie's it's doing a, it from a good the seabed question, as well with, really with different nodes as a well. A show of hands, does anybody disagree with that? make it easier. <laughs> no, that's interesting. Yeah, there we go. That's fairly so simple and fairly this? straightforward, isn't it? How yeah. do we get it there? Um, well, let me come. We've got 10 minutes left. Let me come to the floor because I'm sure there must be questions from the floor. Um, let me just put my glasses on. Um, I think, can we have a microphone down uh, on the floor? First down here and then uh, here, please. Yes. If you could just say your name and organization. Uh, that's well. Thank you. Uh, it's not, is it, could you just, yeah, it's not quite working, yeah, thank you. Still the same, Fritish Katwa, I'm former ambassador 
explore of the sea and all type of things. And I did a lot of negotiations. <laughs> and I didn't find myself completely in the discussion here, because uh, sharing data means also collecting data. And what I have seen 10, 15, 20 years ago was all type of suspicion of espionage. Mm -hmm. And when you were doing all these collecting devices, and there was always an interference in sovereign rights of this and that. And I remember the tsunami in 2004, I think it was, where there was no connection between the countries. A lot of people could have been saved because there was one or two hours the tsunami coming down from Thailand to Sri Lanka. And because India was blocking, Sri Lanka was blocking, and so on. But I have lost time and time and again in my negotiations, where there was endless discussions of chapter 14 of UNCLOS and oceanography and uh, what was right and wrong. <laughs> so is this suspicion now better? When I hear my colleagues who are now doing BBNG, I am not completely convinced. <laughs> and a second point to Mauritius, uh, no, Maldives, you were speaking about that. I'm, I'm one of the authors of the ITLOS in Hamburg. And I see for the last two years, Maldives and Mauritius quarreling over all type of questions there. And of course, this must have also some impact on how to collecting uh, information and so on. Thank you. So briefly, if we could just perhaps answer those two questions. Is there a greater suspicion um, uh, or lesser suspicion uh, nowadays about uh, the collection of data particularly? Um, who would like to jump in? Well, you're doing that right away, Jamie. So well, what, what you... uh, there, I mean, I've been working in the field of hydrography for many years, um, and for a large part of that at government level. And yes, there is always suspicion in sharing bathymetry depth data because um, it's hidden. So if you've got something that's hidden, why would you want to share it? And I think that's some, the attitude that, that a lot of organizations take, unfortunately. Um, I think also, you know, that, that has been opening up over the years. Um, the IOC, the International Hydrographic Organization, have been doing a lot of work to convince nations to look at how they better share data. And a lot of that is happening, and that's really good news. Um, I, I think occasionally, you know, there, there is a, a shock to the system and, and world events that we've seen at the moment uh, causing some organisations to look more closely at what they do share for obvious reasons. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think from what I've seen, uh, if I give a shout out to the biologists, because we've been talking to them about geophysics and other things, when it comes to you know, the, the, what lives in the sea, um, negotiations around BBNJ in particular, the questions around marine genetic resources, very, very sensitive. We look at fisheries, for example. You know, the single greatest devastating impact we're having on the ocean right now is fisheries. More fish is being taken out of the ocean. Um, we, there's more data about fisheries. Is that data being shared? Is that delivering the kind of outcomes that we need? No, it's getting worse. So, you know, there's something at the heart of this which is, uh, which is, which is problematic. Did you come across any of the problems that he was talking about in relation to the Maldives and Mauritius? Uh, I didn't, I'm afraid, no. We, uh, I can't speak on behalf of the Maldives Absolutely. government, fortunately. Uh, <laughs> we had a question down here, I think, in the front. Could we, could we get a, a microphone down here? Are there any other questions as well? Oh, there's one over there. Well, let's start here, please. I have one question. Someone in the audience. <laughs> Maybe you can... Hello. Hello. Yes. Thanks. Uh, I'm Pedro. I'm a oceanographer. I work for Deimos, a space company here in Europe. And I, was, uh, I, I would like to ask uh, Kimberly, please, uh, to maybe extend a little bit more on the financial sustainability. What are the prospects for financial sustainability of platforms like Hub Ocean? Because we've seen several initiatives like this, even Blue Cloud that was shown in the first panel. It's kind of similar. We had the DS platforms here in Europe also, so if, I guess Europe has a long experience with this kind of initiatives. Uh, I'm also a part of ILIA, the project, so we might even collaborate in the future. But uh, the thing is that once the project's finished, 
usually the infrastructure is not available anymore, so people are not really willing to deploy new uh, uh, applications, new ideas there, because they know that in another couple of years they will lose it. So how do you see uh, to pr a way to provide this financial sustainability? Do you think that we need to centralize uh, something on the United Nations or something like that? Or is, it, uh, is there a pathway through commercial activities and commercial support? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's an excellent question because, you know, coming into this space and looking deeply, that's one of the things that just gives your, you know, your heart, uh, oh my God, like when you see these incredible efforts that went so far that, you know, brought together pieces of information which were truly unique and they don't exist anywhere else in the world. And then, then what happened? The funding ran out. And the whole data asset stranded by the roadside. And I sometimes got this picture in my head that the road to building the true ocean knowledge that we need is just littered with all these incredible stranded assets of data because the funding ran out. So I certainly don't claim to have the answer to, to that overall problem. Um, governments and private industry continuing to fund these efforts is spectacularly important. What I can say from the standpoint of one entity, right, that Hub Ocean, that I'm responsible for designing a future in, I benefit from having very predictable, secure, industrial, philanthropic money for years to help us establish something that could be truly complementary and truly additive to this exercise that we're all talking about for the world. It, that's a, a position of privilege, which I am completely aware of. I also find it completely necessary to even try to go this path that we're going. And so when I talk about the expectations that my funding also has is when we get to a three-year point, certainly a five-year point, that we will be able to fund a substantial amount of our running costs through what? Through, it must be, data as a service business model to commercial actors who would choose to say, your enriched aggregated data products are also essential for the ongoing core profit-making interest in my company. And we see evidence for that at every turn. I mean, take wind energy, right? The proposition for us to unlock a lot of the oil and gas data that we know about, to speed along wind energy, we've got to get 40 times more renewable energy built super fast, right? And we know so little about the ocean space and we're going to compete. You know, there's going to be 10 times more build out in this ocean space, right? In a very short space of time, plus MPAs that want to get 30% of the territory. Think of the competition and what we don't know about that ocean under pressure so far. The urgency to bring data together so that, if you look purely from an industrial logic, so that the right build-out can happen as fast as possible, so that it doesn't take seven years or 10 years or 12 years, right, to get those first wind parks operational in places that are seeking to even put out a bid for those right now. That's a very, very profoundly valuable agenda for those who would develop the wind parks. If they believe that by sharing data and building on the back of everyone's increasing knowledge, for example, in the North Sea, we have seven countries in a very small geography in one geological basin called the North Sea, and the fish don't know if they're swimming in Netherlands water or Norwegian water or Scottish water, or, right? If they believe that that's very, very value-added, which it's you know, a strong hypothesis at the moment that they will, and the Netherlands government is the first in the world that I know of to move on, one of the propositions they have is if you want to win a bid for wind licensing, then you will commit to opening up all data, all data to create an ocean platform that everybody benefits from. Bravo! Let that become the norm, right? So the bottom line is, though, if those industrial actors need more, and they need more data for everything they're doing, regulatory requirements, deep knowledge about the ocean, right, to make these happen in the right places, to engineer them long term for the right, in the right reliability, that's a, the business model, tick, tick, tick along. I could do the same thing in shipping. I could imagine that finance, everybody I know working in finance, probably everybody in this room too, are deeply dissatisfied about the state of data. So what's the opportunity, secondary to a mission, to draw revenue streams off Kimberly, of? can I jump in and just, we do have time for one, I hope, one more question. Uh, there was somebody down here at the back, right at the back, please, yes. Uh, so my name's um, Rory Usher, I'm from The Metals Company. 
Um, my question is, you know, based upon the conversations that we've been having today, it seems that you know, lowering barriers to data sharing seems to be a key sort of and a fundamental uh, element to addressing, you know, to, to sort of expanding our knowledge um, and delivering the data we need to understand and address the challenges that face our ocean. Um, but I wonder whether, you know, how at the, um, among, you know, in the creation of these ecosystems to curate this data, how do we ensure that that doesn't act as an impediment to the wider sharing of this information? Um, you know, Jamie mentioned that there are suspicions, um, you know, around, from amongst industry and elsewhere about getting people to share their data. Um, but, you know, from my, from my organization, for example, you know, we've collected over a quarter of a million square kilometers of bathymetric survey data yet, and we are absolutely committed to sharing this with the world, and yet we've been turned away, including by Seabed 2030, simply because of the industry in which we operate. So well, doesn't that seem as, you know, talk about sort of leaving no stones unturned, yeah. isn't that leaving that 20% that you mentioned? Briefly, and I'm ask, going to ask you, Jamie, if you just respond to that briefly. Sorry, can I just... Your, your organisation is... Uh, it's the metals company. Uh, right, but, but I think, as I understand it, you, you submit your data to the ISA, is that correct? Yes, uh, yes which, and that's which, forthcoming. Which has a direct relationship with the International Hydrographic Organisation, which then archives your data in uh, the data centre of a digital bathymetry in Boulder, Colorado, for which we then take a feed. But that sort of runs slightly counter to what we've been talking about. I mean, this is a conversation. So, so your, your data is publicly available, as I understand it, if it's going to Boulder, and therefore it's, it's therefore accessible by anybody who wants to use it, and particularly us who are making a map. I am going to ask you two to pick that up yeah, outside yeah. if you can, yeah. because we have uh, run out of time, I'm afraid. I think it's a fascinating discussion, and I think we're all on the same page in a sense here. I think there are still some questions about the public ownership of the data, and even questions, if you don't mind me saying, Kimberly, about whether commercialization of data does potentially result in lack of access or inequitable access to the data. But nevertheless, I think we're all moving in the direction, I think, that you're suggesting, and indeed that Vladimir was suggesting in the earlier uh, round as well. So do please join me in thanking everybody in this panel, uh, Oliver. Kimberly, uh, Andre, and uh, Jamie. Thank you very much indeed. Thank and you. thank you, Charles. <laughs> thank you.